2016, Microsoft uh, produced a, an AI-based chatbot named Tay, they called it. And Tay was um, meant to be on social media and interacting with people. The target audience was about 15 to age 24. And it was completely AI-driven, based off, learned based off of uh, existing tweets and existing social media type uh, conversations. And um, it didn't take long. Within 24 hours, um, the folks on 4chan got a hold of Tay. And within 24 hours, Tay turned into this sweet persona of a perhaps a young lady uh, into a uh, sexist, racist, uh, everything horrible that you can imagine within 24 hours. So quickly that Microsoft took it down within 24 hours. And it was, that was the end of that project. So the example that we're giving here is um, that AI can be tricky. AI can be tricky. Neural networks, deep learning, this stuff can be tricky. Um, this is going to be some of a primer of that. Um, my name is Ron Winward. I'm on the global evangelist team at Radware. And um, we're going to dive into this. I want to thank you for coming. This is my favorite event. I mean, I love this event. I've been lucky to speak at it three times in the past. Uh, I guess this is my third official presentation, but uh, thanks for being here and making this what it is. So this, if you don't know this, this is the cyber kill chain, something that Lockheed Martin has put together that shows us seven points and intersections in the network where we as network people and network operators can identify threats or breaches or issues in the network. And it also has a, 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 a a list of the time frames that these things start to happen. So it shows us where attacks are targeted. We see that we have plenty of opportunities to identify attacks or threats and risks. But still, we have these breaches. And we have these breaches that we don't find out about until six months, eight months. Maybe we don't know about it at all until somebody sends us a ransom letter that says, hey, by the way. Um, two reasons for this, mainly, that we'll talk about data. Not having enough visibility into data, not having enough visibility into what's happening. We're the other end of that, too much data, too much visibility into what's happening, so much that we can't really figure it out uh, as humans. So um, let's dig into some of uh, what this is. This is one of my favorite examples of, of a concept that we're going to talk about. False positives, which I'm sure we're all aware of, and false negatives. But I love this. A type 1 error, the guy on the left, you're pregnant, right? This is a false positive. Of course, he's not pregnant. We know this. But the type 2 error that we're going to talk about as well, a false negative. Of course, this uh, patient is pregnant. But the false negative, the concept of a false negative is a discriminator saying, no, 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 everything's fine. These, all, all of these events that come through and all of these events that happen, don't worry about them. They're not a risk, right? That is an example of a false negative. But on the false positive side, this is the problem that we are plagued with as network operators and in security as well. Think about all of the syslog messages you get out of our on bar log messages on a Juniper or you know, all, of the, all of the event information that we receive in our SOC and our NOC and all of these, uh, this data. I'm a data person. I love data. It helps us be better at our jobs. It helps us make actionable decisions. But too much data can be a problem. Um, this is an example of a positive security model. In security, you'll hear us talk about something called a positive security model and something called a negative security model. In positive security model, this is the behavioral type stuff, the algorithms that help us make decisions. So let's start. Uh, this is basically graphing sensitivity of a, of a model or a defense versus the probability of a false action, a, a, an action that we don't want. So if we're looking at the bottom left, we have a security policy where we're saying, allow everything through here. And if we go all the way to the right, it's deny everything. And this, everybody in this room, I'm sure, is comfortable with these concepts. But let's look at what they do with the false positives. If we're denying all, we have a lot of false positives. If we don't let anything through, we're not letting through the good traffic. So we're determining good traffic as being a false positive, right? And if we slide that back down to the left, if we allow everything through, well, we're not going to have any false positives, right? But what we'll have is false negatives. The false negative, remember, is the guy at the, at the door or the security policy saying, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Everything's OK. Come on in. There are no security events here. That's a false negative. Where do we want to be? Where do you think? Somewhere 
smack dab in the middle, right, of course. Now, with that's the positive security model. Negative security models, we can change some of these lines. Negative security models are things that you are all familiar with. We do them on our routers every day. Who's allowed to SSH into my router? Negative security models are whitelists and blacklists, right? Things we're used to, we've been doing them for 20 years. So, this creates a paradox of having all of this information and all of these data points that we need to, uh, to analyze and view, and it really creates a problem of the more data you actually see, or the more things that you actually see, it makes it harder to actually see the thing you're looking for. A good example of this from our childhood is where's Waldo? Where's Waldo? Books or pages are thousands of characters of somebody. And it makes it hard to find the actual Waldo. If there were only 10 images or 10 people on the page, it would be real easy to find Waldo. That's what we're dealing with as network operators and as security people. It's literally a, a, a uh, needle in the haystack. So this is where the need for automation, and not just security, but even regular event analysis and event correlation, log analysis, those kind of things, help us as network people understand what's happening in the network. Um, a good SOC, let's, let's say you're a, we probably have them in the room, a multinational 10,000 employee uh, type company. And you're in the, the SOC, the Security Operations Center for this company. A very large network with a lot of users is going to generate a lot of alerts potentially, right? Or maybe you have an event in the NOC and something happens and you're having 100 tickets open, right? That can be a lot to handle for somebody. So we can look to rule-based correlation of these things to say, well, some of this don't worry about, some of this you should worry about, some of this is interesting data, feed that to the humans to make decisions on. But this is where automation can really help us and decide, uh, make us better uh, at making decisions in our network. Um, there's another term that we will talk about later here, but it's applicable here, is general, generalization. If I'm, a, if I'm a network or I'm a model that's learning something that is good or something that is bad. Maybe I'm making that decision based off of tickets that a SOC or a NOC has closed and said, this don't worry about, this is fine. We have this concept of generalization, which is I don't have the exact data points already, but I have something similar to it. So I can probably glean information out of that similarity and make a generalization of this was okay, it's kind of similar, so this is probably okay as well, right? And that's generalization, we'll talk about that too. Um, all of these events, all of these difficulties is really where machine learning comes in to, to help us doing, um, running our networks. This image is a little bit to go through, but we'll go through it and, and it makes sense once we, once we break it down. So we have two concepts that we will talk about mostly today. Machine learning and we'll have deep learning. And, and these are seen as subsets of artificial intelligence. Uh, but we're not going to talk about truly, you know, deep artificial intelligence. We're going to talk about these because this is, this is what is applicable in the security space right now. So on the left, we have more of a machine learning type architecture. And this exists a lot in, in the security space today. My company does it. A lot, of companies other, a lot of other companies do it. This is, on the left, more of a, what we would call a machine learning model. Machine learning model, as you can see, um, based heavily on code that humans write to come up with an algorithm. And, and the action or the decision from the algorithm is heavily influenced by humans or what we've told we, the algorithm we want it to do. Here's an example, think about TCP. TCP, we know that we have a certain amount of sins, we have a certain amount of sin acts, and then we can expect a certain amount of acts, and we can expect a pretty good model of what should be look normal in a network. If we have a huge, huge spikes in SINs, that's out of parameter of what the model would say, and that's probably a SIN flood, for example, right? So these are deterministic machine learning type algorithms that exist in a lot of the, the security solutions today. As we can see in the complexity line, in terms of complexity of these, it's on the easier end of things. Now if we look to the right, we have more of deep learning type things. This is where uh, the data is influencing what happens. The data that is being put into the model is influencing the output of, of what the model decides. This is a lot less based on what humans can write for the code to come up with these things. So 
And we'll talk about these. Here on the bottom right is an example of something called a neural network. You probably have heard of the term neural network. A neural network is a decision model based off of the, loosely based off of the human brain. And the concept of we have neurons that link together, and we have input being fed in, and then ultimately a decision is, is made from the model. Um, neural networks need a lot of data to be trained. You train a neural network. Um, and ultimately, sometimes these things come up with crazy answers. And you ask the neural network, why did you come up with that answer? It says, it's just my answer. You gave me data, that's my answer. So, um, how this plays into security. Um, machine learning tends to be more of like a real-time, zero-day mitigation type thing. If I know something is an anomaly, if I know something is unique and interesting and anomalous, and I can identify it real-time, that is a strength for mitigation of machine learning. That's more of like an on-premise, a perimeter type solution, fits inside of a, a small one U, two U box, five U box, whatever. The deep learning stuff, this is more your cloud-based, you know, deep, heavy compute type solutions. Because of the complexity of the models, they're not always going to be uh, zero day type, uh, real time type of identifiers. Their job is to crunch and come up with information and look for unique things. Um, and they're not really meant to be on premise, right? Because of the compute that's required, because of the size, because of the data that has to be fed into the network to, to train them. So, but they do work together. They do work together, and there are a lot of solutions out there that uh, you can use to, to, to have these help with defend your network. Neural networks are as good as the size of the data that you feed into them. Their, their, their accuracy is as good as what you give it. So large networks have a high capacity for learning. They can do more things, they can understand more parameters, but they require a lot more data and a lot of good data to be trained and fed, right? So that's an example of this, uh, this blue line. We can see that if we're graphing performance versus the data that we feed into it, only towards a lot of data do we gain optimal performance here. Now if we look at a small neural network, we gain that optimal performance much quicker, but it can only do a certain amount of things, right? A smaller scope of things can remember certain, a smaller amount of things, um, and this is, this is, these are challenges for people that are writing these. How do you decide what is the right size of your neural network? How do you decide what is the right amount of data to feed to your neural network, to train it? How do you decide once uh, you've given it bad examples or good examples, if that is real data that you should trust? Or did it give you the right answer? Did it give you what you were thinking, what you were looking for? Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Andrew Ning is one of the, um, one of the major names in the, in the space. Uh, he was with Google for some time, a co-founder of Google Brain, and then uh, Baidu, who's a, a, a Chinese company. Um, he gave an example of, for their data sets to train their speech recognition neural network, it was 100,000 hours of audio. 100,000 hours is, if you put it sequentially, it would be 11 years of a, a constant audio feed that the neural network has to train against to understand this is what I'm looking for. Another example, facial recognition. 200 million images, their data sets, their networks go through to understand and learn facial recognition. So, um, generalization I talked about. Remember it was the beginning, in the beginning we were talking about this is kind of looks good, this kind of looks similar to the other thing, so it's probably good as well. Um, we have an example here of the size of the neural network is not necessarily like too small of a neural network results in something called underfitting. It's not enough data to really come up with a good, with a good answer of, of what we're looking for. And then we have something called overfitting, way too much information. So let's look at these images on the, the top right. This is a graph, if you can't see it, we're graphing happiness versus wealth. Now we as humans realize that there is not an exponential growth in happiness versus wealth. Maybe some of that comes from experience, but some of that just comes from intuition and logic, right? And if we look on the right, this is an example of overfitting. There are too many data points here, and we don't want to be looking at everything here because it doesn't necessarily mean that I have a dip in, in, uh, in happiness with more wealth, and then I have a big jump, and then a dip, and then a, another jump. 
this one in the middle is the right fit for this, for this data set and, and this network. And we can see that generally, we, there's probably some, some, some gained benefit, but right around as we gain more wealth and more wealth and more wealth, some of that happiness tends to, it's not incremental growth anymore. This is an example of underfitting and overfitting. And why this is important as we're making decisions from our data sets, uh, we'll talk about shortly. Um, deep learning has some issues. It has some issues with uh, dealing with change or new introduction of new data sets. Um, and we will talk about more of these, but just as a, as a fundamental principle, um, handling change, handling, handling new information, asking it to do new things or look at something else, often causes a recalculation of everything, starting over from the beginning. So, so many of the examples that you'll see, if you go we'll look up videos or YouTube uh, or talks at DEF CON or Black Hat, people will tell you about, well, I did this with my neural network, and it gave me this horrible, stupid answer, and of course I know that, but it, it, it gave me that answer because I asked for the wrong thing. And ultimately, what I had to do was retrain the entire thing again and run it again. So that's an example of some of this for deep learning can be a challenge. Um, Honeypots are a good example of um, where we can get good data. So a lot of security vendors have honeypot networks out on the internet, and they're just listening for things that are attempted attacks. Uh, these are good ways for people to come up with good, strong, labeled, structured data to be able to say, I know that this is a bad thing. I know that this is a bad thing. And then ultimately, later, work that into a security solution down the road. Uh, this is where this gets very interesting and challenging for the space. So people understand that if I, my data set, my solution is only as good as the data that I give it. And people have learned, in the example of Tay, for example, that we can poison that data set. And we can manipulate the algorithm or the neural network to, to do what we want by giving it bad information. Because it's learning from that bad information, too, right? So we can poison the data set. We can introduce problems to the data set, and I'll, go, I'll talk about an example of that as well. Um, and then adversarial machine learning. So we have the, in security specifically, we have the challenge of learning about a network constantly in the presence of adversarial traffic, right? We're constantly trying to understand what is good while being bombarded with bad stuff, right? So this, is, this can be a challenge in, in in, um, in deep learning systems as well. So here are some examples of, of poisoning some of these data sets. This, uh, this is a pretty famous example. This is an image, of course, of a sports car uh, on the left. Um, but by, by adding some noise, noise like you could do this in, uh, in Photoshop, uh, to the photo, we can't see the difference here. On this projector, you can't see the difference. This looks like the same picture to us, right? The neural network in this case identified this one as a sports car, this one as a toaster. <laughs> so another example. We know this guy, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky. Um, by adding noise, the neural network identified him as Keanu Reeves. And now I could kind of see Keanu Reeves, you know. But, but uh, anyway, here's another example. I'm more um, close to our heart as technologists and the future of this stuff. These, we of course know every one of these is a stop sign. We know that. We know that this one back here is a stop sign that's off far, far away. We know that if we're driving down the road that if one of these is half covered by a tree, we still know it's a stop sign. We know that if there's reflection on it, we know that if it's blowing in the wind, that it's still a stop sign. The machines don't, aren't here yet on this. So this is a pretty famous example where some of the, um, the networks that were identifying these, one of them was identified as a 35 mile an hour speed limit sign, and another one was identified as a yield sign. Two very, very different things than a stop sign, right? This also is where generalization will be important um, in, in data sets, in understanding data sets. This is one of the coolest things uh, that I as I've been studying this and understanding this, this is one of the coolest things that I, that I like to talk about. So um, we all know ARPANET, and we all know DARPA, right? So 
DARPA in 2016 had this, pro, this contest called the Cyber Grand Challenge, and it took, ha it took place with, uh, with, I think, Black Hat, and corresponded with Black Hat. Uh, but this was 2016, and the concept of this was capture the flag. So the concept, the idea of these machines were autonomous, they were built, and their, their job was to be untouched by humans for 11 hours. And game operators, or the people controlling the game, would introduce vulnerabilities into every one of these machines. It would introduce, here's a, a, a vulnerability or something that could be exploited. The concept of the game was that each of these systems had to identify its own vulnerability, but also attack its neighbors. So it had to patch itself, hot patch itself in real time, and also exploit the, the, its neighbors' vulnerabilities and try to take every one of them out. This is successful, this is really happening. This was 2016, um, a company out of Pittsburgh um, with ties to Carnegie Mellon, uh, For All Secure was the name of the company who won. Uh, and they won a defense contract for, for two years. It's probably up pretty soon. But, um, but this is true, like every one of these cabinets has machines that are using AI to identify its own vulnerabilities, hot patch its own vulnerabilities without the assistance of a human things that were introduced in flight, right? They, weren't, they didn't just exist and it and uncovered them. And then also looking for problems in its neighbor to take its neighbor down too. Totally fascinating to me. So we have this issue where often we do in security where people attacking us sometimes have the upper hand. And the people attacking us are using neural networks and deep learning and machine learning to attack us and really this is a problem for us in the industry, right? So malware is a good example. Here somebody gave uh, an a talk on their, their project, Malgan. What this was using was uh, a neural network to ship uh, malware into a network. And there was, um, there was sys tools that you would imagine on a, the perimeter of a network whose job was to identify malware and not let it through, right? But what this thing would do was identify, okay, if this didn't get through, let me tweak something in the binary that would not make it match a signature on the security device. And if it didn't get through, it would try again, it would try again. Using machine learning to, to in real time, modify the payload of an attack to try and get it through on-premise systems. Uh, hive nets and swarm bots, this is something, um, I think maybe Fortinet was, was talking about this first, but uh, this is the concept of autonomous bots. So really we have, there's this whole other issue of IoT botnets right now. And we have IoT botnets controlling other IoT botnets. Um, we have IoT botnets fighting and killing other IoT botnets. But the concept of these things using machine learning uh, is something that is on the radar of, of the security space. Um, spear phishing at scale using uh, natural language processing. This is an example of Neural networks coming up with ways to training data that is real information. It scans our social media feeds, it scans emails, coming up with real live data sets of real good information, and then using that to do targeted phishing and, and um, um, uh, you know, email campaigns. Oh, we'll talk about an example of that shortly. And then raising the, the noise floor. The, this is an example of the Microsoft Pay, for example. If you can in inject bad information, you can, no, this is a little bit different. This is the concept of if you can inject enough bad information, new data into the, into the model, the model could be forced to recalculate itself to then maybe account for your bad data as part of its training data set or potentially known good data. So CAPTCHA is a really interesting example of this. Um, all CAPTCHA is a waste of time. You know that? All CAPTCHA is a waste of time. We know that's as humans, but every solution of CAPTCHA is now beatable by machines. Uh, as, as recently as 2012, as, as far back as 2012, but as recently as 2016. The machines are better at CAPTCHA than I am, is what this is saying. 98% effectiveness. How many, it takes me two or three times to ultimately get through a CAPTCHA. There's one other interesting point that I want to show you, and this is, these are you know, references for each of these. Um, examples, but there's one thing that I want you to understand as well. Here's an example of Google, Google's uh, recapture. What was happening in maybe 2014, I think that they were talking about this, they were using us 
to train their networks. They were using osteoids to say, this is wine, this is not wine. This is a cat, click all of the cats, right? And they were open about this, but it's fascinating, right? Because we are being used to train the network. I thought, incredible. Uh, I talked a little bit about natural language processing and using um, machines to identify uh, vulnerabilities. This is a recent example that was talked about, uh, presented at Black Hat, where somebody basically built a neural network that would identify, um, it would go through and, t and spear fish people through Twitter and try to go through their own Twitter feeds and the people that they know about and identify things that would get somebody's attention and maybe have them click a link. Um, and they also compared this, their bot, to a human. So in the example of the bot, it was successful. Uh, it, it sent spear phishing tweets to over 800 users at 600 or 6, 6.75 tweets per minute. It was able to get 275 victims versus a human who could come up with the same kind of uh, something that would lure somebody in. He was able to get just a, about one tweet per minute um, and was only able to get 49 users to respond. So the machines are already better at this and faking real users, right, into, into uh, clicking on links that are in, in Twitter. This is a fascinating thing. I would, I would encourage you to maybe look this up. Um, this was somebody who was able to, this was two guys who presented at DEF CON talking about how they were able to go ahead and basically brute force any information that they wanted out of a SQL database based on a neural network that they built. So what they did, and they said in this video that it was only 200 li lines of Python. 200 lines of Python was able to dump an entire SQL database. Um, basically what they did was they used a neural network that started with select star fro, F-R-O, and then it let the neural network start to train everything beyond that. And once it got from, it, it would, you know, it identified that that was a success. And then further down, it was able to brute force the entire and leak the entire database just by a neural network doing two, running on 200 lines of Python. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, I've got about two minutes left. So, um, we have an issue in, as, a, as an industry, right? We have an issue of too much information. And so what do we do with that information? Um, we learned that machine learning techniques are good at helping defend networks uh, a little bit easier. We learned that deep learning is good at helping defend networks as well, but it's a little bit more abstract and harder and less definite. Um, we have to remember that good data is the absolute most important thing that we can use to train these networks. And getting that good data is hard for, 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 for our own networks. What's good for data for your network is different than what's your, your network and different for what's for your network. Attackers have a little bit more advantage here. They know what's good and what's bad. Um, so in the absence of good data, we have another challenge. We need to be able to train the networks with very, um, in very adversarial environments in a little amount of data, and that's just a challenge for, for neural networks, for, for big networks, right? So one of the places that we get this today is crowdsourcing information, or maybe honeypots, or maybe sharing threat intel between the community. And ultimately, you know, this is potentially where this, this could go. But the big thing here is that this deep learning stuff is 40-year-old technology, right? And we have some advancements, specifically GPUs, just like we, you know, they're helping us with with crypto mining, they're helping us with AI as well. They've helped us with the compute power on this, but the question remains to be seen. It really does. You know, I work in security, we're working in networking. Deep learning is a, is a big space that we're just touching right now, right? So machine learning absolutely helps us with real-time defenses. Deep learning helps us with identifying things, but it's more reactive. Combining the two together is helping us, but where it goes, uh, you know, remains to be seen. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you for joining. If there are any questions, I think we have a, a minute or two.